So many of us look to the wisdom of the East to solve our problems in the West. Growing up in America, I too had a lot of questions. And I met a lot of religious leaders who claimed to have the answers. But were these gurus real or just full of it? To find out, I decided to impersonate a spiritual leader and build my own following. That's how I became Kumare. Hello! If you act like a guru, then you can become a guru, no? Then you come like this. Excellent. Have a guru, it's really wild. Begin to feel the blue light. I feel myself getting warmer than normal. I'm sure that's your energy. I have always wanted to connect with the true authentic yeah. person from India. I have intense feelings about the whole planet. The purity, the honesty, there's nothing um, phony about it. You don't know if I am good, I am bad. You don't know that. I just can't believe that you would come and spend this much time with individuals. Just what you're doing right here, by coming here and helping others, the most important thing you can do. I will tell my kids, my grandkids, about this wonderful person that came into my life and changed me. I am the biggest faker that I know. I fake so much, I forget who I was before. to collapse into the guru-disciple model rather than to maintain uh, an individuated adult-to-adult -adult relationship even though the power dynamics are unequal between teacher and student. There's a tendency to collapse into what might be seen as a kind of leftover from tribal behavior when we're, we collapse. It, it, it seems to be ready-made. We can fit ourselves into what we think is a guru-disciple relationship. We can idealize and we can project certain needs. We've also been talking about uh, the creation of ritual and the power of ritual to create a sacred space and, what, and the uh, potential for all of us to be transformed within that sacred space. So we watched the movie Kumare as an illustration principles of ritual and principles of guru-disciple dynamics. So I know you've also enjoyed this movie, Alan. Do you have something to say? Yeah, I was thinking about it uh, today, uh, and it occurred to me that, uh, first of all, my response to Kamari was, I like him. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, uh, Two, two thoughts occurred to me. One is that uh, he was a con man, uh, which is short for confidence man. Uh, and that the job of a confidence man, and I don't think that was not necessarily his intention, but that was, that was the way he was functioning. The, the job of a confidence man is to win your confidence, is to make you like and believe him, uh, which, you know, and then he takes all your money. Which, which, is, which Kumari didn't do. I don't think his motivations were, were that venal. Um, but his function uh, seemed to be that way. And when the con man is in character, uh, he is that character. Uh, and there's, you know, there's some David Mamet movies that you could watch that, I think House of Games, mm -hmm. uh, that really shows you, and where the blurring of character uh, and uh, authenticity is really confusing. So that's something to think about. The other thing that, that occurred to me was um, that Kumari really embodied something that all of us, uh, as we are teachers or becoming teachers, uh, 
carry within us in to various degrees, which is that uh, I'm an imposter. He really was, he really is an imposter. Uh, but to, to each teacher, there's somewhere and some message that, that I think we carry that it's very hard to admit to or own to uh, in the, the sense of which we feel like an imposter. And this was straight out, completely out, uh, that role. So, uh, and yet, as con man, as imposter, in whatever role he was, there were people who actually seemed to benefit. He helped them find, he helped them see something that was in, within themselves, their capacity to be happy, uh, even if they were fooled into happiness. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, and I can see why uh, the critics, uh, some of the critics I looked online, uh, felt this was uh, deeply unethical. I can see that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm curious to know what, what you all think about the things that, that I'm saying in that race. I, I couldn't believe that the people that were interviewed on there would sign a release. I mean, I'd be mortified. Mm -hmm. I'd be then taken in. I mean, but... You're saying that they had to have signed a release. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I of course they had to sign a release, but I mean, you know, you'd be saying, yeah, I really fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Um, but but I, I, don't, I don't, I think, you know, it's, it would be interesting to see who, who thinks it's unethical. I mean, usually the, the people who, where the curtains pull back and they're exposed, you know, well, that's not ethical, that's not fair. You know, so I don't know who the critics are. I mean, there might be some men, of the, men or women of the cloth that, that uh-oh, you know. No, these are film <laughs> critics. No, these are film <laughs> critics, okay. Um, but I, as a, as a as classroom teacher, sometimes I see that, and see you can be a lot, see people that you know would, would believe anything I said. I said, no, mm. you shouldn't believe me. You shouldn't believe anybody. You should, you know, you need to figure this out. Think it for yourself. No, so please tell me the answer. No, I'm not going to tell you the answer. It's, it's like a reflex. Some people. Yeah, and then, it's, it's and then, inherent in our human capacity. I I, I think so. Or or parents, you know, I in Spanish, I, I put my faith, my faith. And you, like, no, no, no. <laughs> he's your kid, you know. <laughs> you know, not. She's not my kid. He's your kid. When it comes to the ethical situation, I have a difficulty deciding whether the words that he spoke—that he came from a long line of Kumaris—and I, I didn't get the whole thing there, but mm -hmm. or whether his deeds were more important. What, what, what it would. When it comes to the ethicality, what's more important, what he said or what he did? And uh, given what he did, he made a lot of people pretty happy by allowing them to come together and create something. So, That's an interesting point because in Buddhism, it's the intention first, then the words and deeds, thought, thought you know. And so, in some ways, he's he got away with it because his intentions were not so self-centered in the usual way. Except he wanted to make a movie. He yeah. wanted to make a movie. <laughs> I felt, looking back when Alan brought this up, that I, he wasn't really tuned to the ethical issue at the beginning, it didn't seem like to me. When he got to the point of unveiling, he, I think he felt bad and he was feeling more the ethics of having misled people. But I think at the beginning, in a, in a kind of fresh way, he wasn't thinking, is this right or wrong? Well, I think because of what he was doing in making this film, he wasn't accountable to any ethics board. So if I were to do something like this, I would be accountable to the Board of Psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have to run something like this through a human subjects committee, mm -hmm. which they would not approve. Mm -hmm. because there's no way to show there wouldn't be harm to people. But because he was, this was an independent project, I don't think he was accountable. And I think it's really interesting what you bring up 
about he wasn't in tune with the ethics because he wasn't really connected to anyone. Right. Right. And his ethics came out of the relationships mm -hmm. and actually caring and being connected. So I think that that's a really interesting point, that that's where his ethics came in. It's like people could be harmed. I've said I'm going to help them. I told them I'm going away, but now what's going to happen to them? Can I care about that? Yeah. I think it started to happen a little bit before that when he was talking to the one woman by the swimming pool and she started to say some very personal things. I think maybe that's when it began to dawn at him that these people were very vulnerable and that there was some manipulation going on. And um, He was in over his head. In over yeah. his head. Yeah, and exactly. he, couldn't, he couldn't tell whether or not what he was doing was going to help this woman harm this woman right. and he started to have some doubts about it and I think as you say you know that was where maybe some ethical concerns arose but again they arose because of emotional connectivity yes. which he didn't have in the beginning he just mm -hmm. had this idea about he was curious curious about spirituality and his principle of spirituality mm -hmm. and I think that's true for us and uh, when we practice you know we're attracted in a certain way to the teachings and then and then something happens to us in the Sangha and we recognize very much that what we do affects other people very much. So we have to, you know, I went to practice in Japan for that reason. I had a Sangha. I said, geez, I, I, I need more, you know, which means I need more slapping <laughs> to, to be accountable and helpful to these people. I need to go through some tougher training. question for you. I'm, I'm forgetting what you said. You're talking of the guru-disciple relationship as um, echoing, I'm forgetting quite what you said. Well, this, it, it echoes at least our ideas of an Asian model. No, no. You were talking about no, the tribal? Yes, tribal. And yeah. I wonder if, um, if it doesn't go back further to a kind of mammalian uh, alpha model, kind of pack leader model. Well, whether we whether we begin with Homo sapiens yeah. or before, right. <laughs> there's a collection, always animals. There isn't any place on Earth where animals who are right. mammals don't collect in some way to protect each other. So right. So the tribe deep. is what emerged out of that. Yeah, yeah, and the genes, the belief is, and we have it in this book, which I'll show so that people can read it. The genes that survived, they survived because they were people were part of tribes and they came together and stayed together to take care of each other. Right. And it's not happening as much today, and so we see the effects. Actually, there's a need for this kind of social relationship, which Kumari fulfilled. Right. And the effects of loneliness they now found, and this is the book by uh, Kachopo and William Patrick on loneliness, um, affects the nervous system and affects the immune system when we're deprived of this kind of social interaction. So he provided this context for them in a mm -hmm. way that they could nourish themselves. I, I'm glad you brought that up because it strikes me that this can only happen because of group dynamics, the need for people to get together. And I can remember as a kid getting together and making up stories. Sure. And then you kind of enact them. And it's fun and it's communal. And it has kind of that quality in mind. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it, is a, it seems like it happens all over the planet when people get together, whether it's drama or rich or religion, you're going to say something. Well, I just think that fundamentally, um, it was obvious from the beginning that he was a kind person. And a kind? A kind person. I mean, he was in a, <clears throat> a position where he could have been exploited in many ways. Mm -hmm. And there was just no hint of any kind of exploitive uh, activity on his part. I think that's right. I also think that the, the relevance of this to us, um, if we look at the context of within which most religions exist, most of them, uh, the majority of people fall within majority uh, cultural settings. Mm -hmm. Where, so if you're in, in Southeast Asia, Buddha is, Buddhism is the air you breathe. If, if you're in Europe, it's a, there's a, you, Breathe a Christian air, or etc. Middle East uh, uh, Islamic, uh, but for us and for Kumari, yeah. uh, we're the, 
the people that we consort with are people in many ways who are already they already feel they don't fit. They're already plagued by loneliness. They're plagued by disconnection. And so uh, you have to recognize they're, they're especially vulnerable in a way that is not necessarily true if you're functioning within a majority culture. Uh, and I think that he knew who he was drawing. And I suspect he, he, he cotton to their vulnerability and his role uh, pretty early, you know, at a ver very early and uh, also had enough inertial energy to go forward and keep going. I think that energy point is very important because he had training. <coughs> he was trained very much in the culture and the ritual of Hinduism by his family, so he had all that background. And then, furthermore, he went on in university to study religion, oh. and so and then he went on a pilgrimage to India to explore further. So he gathered a lot of skill and had a lot of background um, in his research to think about, you know, well, what makes a religion, what makes people vulnerable, and. How, what is it that makes people uh, become cohesive as a group with a leader? And so he had studied all that and had that in mind. I wanted to pull on that part a little more. Um, it, se it seems he internalized something from his uh, grandmother, who was a deeply religious person and, and uh, had an ongoing active ritual life. And it seems to me that uh, he wasn't really in touch with that until he was in a, a, a sangha, and that, that came out in him. Uh, that, that there, was, there, was some, there was some level of a seed of enlightenment or, or Buddha nature already in him, but he had to do the work for that to, to get to that, uh, the pravritti, the turnaround point, where it wasn't about him anymore, it was about the people that he was uh, uh, conning, and he had to turn around and come out and, and tell them, uh, give them some uh, truth about himself. Well, I, I don't remember exactly how he put it in, in the uh, in the story that uh, how he put it, how he ended up learning so much about himself. He, he, he said it. how much uh, he felt closer to people as Kumari than he ever had in his mm -hmm. life um, before as Vikram. Yeah. So that's very interesting about the actual and authentic intimacy that he developed with people through this means of trying to himself to be selfless and trying to help people with these uh, rituals. And he seemed, uh, whether it was situationally or internally, uh, at least what we saw in the film, we didn't see the outtakes, or we didn't see the outtakes of the outtakes, mm -hmm. he seemed relatively carefully boundaried. But this feeling of intimacy with people which is fresh and new uh, is extremely seductive. You know, that to experience that kind of intimacy uh, when you have, in a way, been starved for it for uh, decades or your life uh, is, it's really, it can be really powerful, and you can really want more, and you can really be drawn in by, uh, by the connection, by the transference, the counter-transference, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's really powerful. And uh, I think that's where, uh, that's where teachers uh, can easily go astray. Mm -hmm. I, I had another observation, sort of tagging onto yours, and it's come up before in spot. Uh, Grace has, of course, mentioned about you know teachers having to really think about where your boundary is between your private, your teaching life, and something as a public teacher. I always have to be wary of like what vibes am I getting? You know, should I let this person come after school, or do we need to have it where there's more people? But it was interesting, and this is probably with every group. You know, there are always the people who say, "Oh, please, I want you to come to my house. You know, I want you to include." 
you know, so it's almost, there became, even though he had like, what, 14 disciples, he had, there was sort of a pecking order of the people who were much more connected personally with him than, than the others that, that didn't get as much airtime in the movie. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, he was trying to see how far I could get mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, with... Devotees. Yeah. You know, with, with devotion. Yeah, but yeah. it was it was interesting to see that, that you know that that's sort of an impulse. Oh, come on, please, we want you to come to the house to to have a special. We want connection. more of you. Yeah. Right. Speaking of airtime, we have four people who sit, situated themselves in the back who haven't <laughs> spoken yet, <laughs> and we have about ten minutes left. So let's see if we can hear something. Well, um, the thing that's going through my head in reflecting on this movie over the past day or so is just. This is a story, and this is the story that he's showing us. He has a particular point he wants to make. So we haven't seen deleted scenes. We haven't seen people mm. reacting to him like, wow, dude, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so you know, in making this movie, he has, he has a point he wants to make, and he makes it very well. Um, but it, it feels like a very carefully crafted story. And you know, what I, I've got a question that can't be answered, and that question is, if at the end of the movie, the majority of his followers had gotten pissed off and felt betrayed, that would change the whole tone of the movie. And would he have even released the movie if most of the people had, had been hurt so badly? Mm -hmm. and so I think he was kind of surprised at how many yeah. stuck with him. Yeah. Yeah. And ten, maybe 10 out of 14 of his, what he called his core disciples. But for me, what really struck me is that this is a very carefully crafted story. Uh -huh. I think you're right. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think I agree with you, and I think the place of unveiling, where he mm -hmm. thought he was actually crafting this story, mm -hmm. he came to a place where he, he he had no control, and it was out of his control, and he didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. So I loved that part of it. That was a very sweet part. Yeah. yeah. At the beginning of the movie. Said some, somebody said something about to the effect that he was the truth to each individual person, whatever they wanted that truth to be. And at the end of the movie, even after he unmasked, they still had the individual <laughs> truth, the reality they created. They weren't letting go of it, no matter, even if, even when he unmasked them, they still thought he had psychic powers or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Some walked, some stayed with him. Everybody had their own individual truth that they were adhering to. And we see that in a saga. Now that this is actually what happens is that some people will say, don't you see the teacher is completely evil, or don't you see the teacher is completely pure, and it doesn't matter what you say or do. Mm -hmm. it, it somehow fits into their story and their mm -hmm. need to work something out. Mm -hmm. it's got something. Well, I, I was interested in the uh, at that point in the movie where he started to realize that he was having an effect on people because they were opening up to him. And again, I don't know if it's because of the way the movie was cut it got, that I got this impression, but it seemed that he started to develop his message um, at that point. So I'm trying to decide whether the message was something he originally came with mm -hmm or whether the message was something that he realized he was going to need an out because he was really um, connecting with people and sort of ad hoc, in an ad hoc way came up with this, the message that he had mm -hmm. uh, in order to deal with the intimacy and the fact that he was in some sense in over his head with people's personal issues. Do you think the message was uh, somehow outside the envelope of basic spiritual teachings? Uh, no, I don't think the message was at all outside the envelope of basic spiritual teachings. It seemed to be very much within the envelope, but it also seemed to me to be a convenient way to start to back out, um, to say you know that you have to look inside yourself. Um, this is you know this is a common um, strategy that people yeah. use. How do I get out of here? Right, <laughs> and, right. And, and, and it's a way. It to, also happens to be true. Well, you know, it happens to be true, and this, I mean, it shows up in Nietzsche and other places yeah. where there's you know, how do you empower the disciples to let go of you? Um, it's an interesting dilemma, but I think I didn't see any sensitivity to the need for that until people really started to open up. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that points to how much his the intimacy and the emotional affect affected him, and how that changed him. Yeah. So I, th I think he did fine tune. I think he did fine tune his message in such a way uh, that there could be a kind of plausible deniability. To he was so he wasn't he wasn't fine tuning his message like oh you have to believe in me, uh, mm -hmm. which he, yes. which which also would not be an unconventional spiritual message. Mm -hmm. He said said over over again that he wasn't like. They thought he was from the very from beginning. The beginning. And he also said, from the beginning, I will be leaving you. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. oh, yes, that's the way it is with all spiritual teachers, you know, that they get you started and then they leave you. Yeah. It was um, one thing that I thought revealed some of his values when he did, went to the Urantia community, was it? Oh, yeah. right. And he said uh, the leader there had been <coughs> accused of exploiting his, his uh, students and so on. And he said, well, all I saw was a lot of happy people. Mm -hmm. So that was that tells us something about what he was he looking was thinking, at. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was harder to read. That community, um, what was happening, you know, in terms of people turning over all their material wealth to those people so that they could continue to live there and what was going to happen to them. Yeah. <laughs> that story didn't, you know, in the moment everybody's happy, right? When things yeah. are going well, it's certain. In certain organizations, they're happy, and you poke in, you say, well, it looks like it's okay. But then something turns, like we saw with that community where people died up in the mountains on retreat, mm -hmm. the Tibetan oh. community and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in Colorado. And all, it, looked, it looked like it was going okay, and they were doing this serious, we're in retreat for a couple of years, and then somebody died, and more of the underbelly came out of yeah. that story. Well, I don't know anything about that community. I was more interested. He in had one of the history. gurus of that community was in that. Yeah, community. he had a cameo. He had a cameo. He had a part. Yeah, as, as an example of a guru. Yeah. Is there anything else anybody would like to say about this?